Hey friends, this is Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. Welcome to this episode of The Underground, a program that explores the testimony of the biblical prophets, the gospel of Jesus Christ, current events, and how all of these things relate to you and me. Now, if you're following along, according to the schedule as these videos are released, if you're following along with the Maranatha Global Bible Study that we're presently doing on the book of Daniel, myself and Dalton Thomas, then this episode is actually a break from that. Um, this, uh, this issue that we're going to discuss today, I've been getting tons of questions, tons of emails, posts, and different things. People ask me, what is your opinion about this? And I've said a few things uh, on social media. Um, I'm a little bit active on Twitter, uh, but Twitter is very brief, and so there's a lot of room for people to misunderstand you, and you can't really qualify things and really lay everything out. So I thought it would be good to take some time on an underground to really discuss this issue. So essentially what's happening right now, just to help everyone understand why I thought this would be a good time uh, to discuss this, is um, I'm recording this on May 1st, 2020. Okay, so we're right in the middle of or just after the hopeful peak of the coronavirus pandemic uh, in the United States. Um, I'm in Kansas and we're talking about opening up my county in about uh, 10 days. So that's good. Uh, we still have no idea what the future holds, but there is a tremendous amount of anxiety, apprehension, fear, and all kinds of conspiracy theories that are floating around in the body of Christ. And let me just say this, uh, because I said conspiracy theory, that'll upset people. How dare you call it a conspiracy theory? It's true. It's true. Um, that's not, the point there is not to be derogatory. Um, there are theories concerning conspiracies. Um, there are ideas concerning conspiracies that are running rampant. Now, let me just say this. It's very understandable. It's entirely understandable. Um, in fact, we'll discuss this a bit more as we wrap this up. But let me just say this. Um, there is an idea, I'll just say a theory, uh, that's floating around that Bill Gates, Microsoft, wants to... Uh, inject everyone with a mandatory coronavirus vaccine, that everyone will be mandated to get it. And then part and parcel of this vaccine will be a microchip, which is the mark of the beast, or it's leading to, it's a predecessor to the mark of the beast. And so you've got all kinds of people that are saying, heck no, I'm not going to take any vaccine. Um, I'm not going to accept the mark of the beast. I will resist, right? So you've really got a few different things. You've got the anti-vaccine, the anti-vaxxer movement, as it's called. So you've got a lot of that stuff intermingling with biblical prophecy, intermingling with the general unease and anxiety and concern that is being felt right now at this heightened time, at this crisis, in the, in the midst of this catastrophe, um, even if you, you know, even if you're someone that doesn't even really give much credence to the coronavirus itself, the whole world shut down, right? So we're in the middle of a crisis. So it's a combination of a lot of things. It's it's really a perfect storm, and that's what I meant when I said it's understandable. Um, you know, uh, I want to hopefully bring some balance to this discussion, but by the same token, I'm not attacking anyone that has concerns. Um, the the goal is to bring people who are freaking out and making untrue statements, making false statements, to bring them back to a place of logic, of level-headedness, of rationality, and concern. Concern's legitimate. We as Christians should be skeptical. We should be discerning. We should be watchful. Paranoid, fear-based is something else entirely. And so there's legitimacy. If you're someone that holds to various conspiracy theories, there is legitimacy to where when your friends and family are concerned because you have this, this frenetic energy over it, and everyone has to understand, everyone has to know, everyone has to be convinced. There's an emotional need, a deep emotional need that everyone has to understand this and believe it, and if anyone says or uses the term conspiracy theory, you immediately lash out at them. That's a problem. 
Again, as people of God, we know that uh, we're not unaware of the schemes of Satan. We understand what prophecy has to say. We understand what's coming, but we do not live in fear. We're not panicked. We're not filled with fear and anxiety, okay? So we're going to talk about that some more. But before we do, I thought it would be good, again, just to highlight some of these things as they're affecting the body of Christ. I've got a picture here um, of Rick Wiles. Rick Wiles is a radio broadcaster. Um, I've actually, uh, in all fairness, um, uh, disclosure, I've been on his program uh, once or twice years ago uh, when I released a book, and I don't even necessarily remember what we talked about, but unfortunately over the past few years, Rick Wiles True News has completely gone off the deep end. Um, Rick has become a virulent anti-Semite. Um, of course, he'll say, no, I don't hate Jews, but he is a purveyor of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and theology, and it's just way, way over the top. Like, he has gone off the deep end. Okay, so it's really unfortunate. He has become one of the leading voices of Christian anti-Semitism, the very thing, the very thing that I warned about so clearly, that I documented carefully the history of Christian anti-Semitism throughout the history of the church and how that has resulted in our actions. And I've warned against that. And, you know, Rick's own son actually created a video. This is something a lot of people probably don't know. Rick's own son actually created a video about, uh, in history, there's this story where the train cars, the cattle cars, used to pull up behind this Lutheran church during World War II and everyone would be in church and they could hear the people screaming. They could hear the Jews that were being hauled away to labor camps and concentration camps and uh, extermination camps. And as the Christians could hear the screams, the choir master would say, everyone sing louder, sing louder. And so here is uh, you know, Rick Wiles' son creating a really powerful video of the need for Christians to wake up to this painful, long continuum, this history of the Christian mistreatment of the Jewish people. And then, unfortunately, Rick went on to become um, a voice for Satan, quite frankly, a voice of anti-Semitism. It's really unfortunate, but here is a video. Um, Rick is broadcasting uh, through Zoom or Skype or something, you know, from his home, as just virtually everyone is. And the title of this video is Mark of the Beast. Bill Gates wants every person on earth to receive a vaccination with digital ID. Okay, so we're going to explore the truth claims there. Does Bill Gates actually want everyone to be vaccinated with a digital ID? Okay, is that true? Is that even true? Because the truth is it's not. The truth is it's not. People are putting things together and through inferences and assumptions uh, and essentially false claims. They're saying that is a plan that's in place, it's about to take place, and it's not. It's not. We'll, we'll talk about that a bit more. Here is a, um, a quote, and this, this is really what kind of stirred this all up in me. So um, some of you may be familiar with this social media um, platform. It's called Nextdoor. So it's essentially like a Facebook for the neighborhood. And um, I've, I don't think I've ever uh, used it, but I get the emails in my neighborhood and I've looked at it. And it's good, you know, people say, hey, does anybody know a good local plumber? This type of thing. Other people complain, did you hear gunshots? Uh, and this type of thing. But here's a statement. So this is from one of my neighbors. Okay, this has happened right up the street from my house. Someone posted, went to Walmart this morning to buy mulch. Since the garden entrance is closed, I went to one of the main entrances. An unknown older man started yelling at me because I was wearing a mask. He was agitated and screamed at me not to get a vaccination. He said that it was all a plot by Bill Gates, who worships Satan. Very upsetting. <laughs> so here's one of my neighbors. She went to Walmart. She's wearing a mask, an older woman. And she says some man started screaming at her, okay? Screaming at a stranger in public, don't get vaccinated. It's a plot by Bill Gates. It's a plot by Bill Gates who worships Satan, okay? He worships Satan on purpose. Bill Gates is a secret Satan worshiper. Now, where does this older man get this information? 
They get it from people like Rick Wiles. They get it from various YouTube uh, broadcasts. They get it from prophecy teachers. They get it from Christian voices, okay? So this is how, this is, you know, we think, well, uh, if we just teach something on YouTube. As teachers, I think about this all the time, guys. As a teacher, it says that I will incur a harsher judgment, which means in many ways that, I mean, you know, I've said it before, I need a leaner judgment. I need a less strict judgment. I mean, that, I need mercy. We all do, right? And yet when we choose to uh, accept the calling to be teachers or simply to have a YouTube program, we are influencing people. And the way, the, the spirit that we walk in the spirit that we walk in will oftentimes, not purely, but it will often be reflected in those that listen to us. Pastors, teachers, leaders, they are not responsible for those who listen to them completely, but they are partially responsible. I've seen this over and over again. Um, when you have a particular teacher that's really fighty, he's really contentious, he names other names all the time, he's attacking them, he uses derogatory terms, his followers will walk in that same spirit. His followers will walk in that same contentious, agitated, angry spirit. It, it spreads. Um, when a teacher really encourages their followers to be loving, to be kind, um, to be thoughtful, to be humble. Oftentimes that will be emulated by those that listen to them. Now the question is, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Are people who are humble and loving uh, drawn to other teachers, or does that teacher produce humility and uh, you know, kindness and this type of thing? And it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. So, and look, we all stumble, and I guarantee you I have stumbled and made mistakes in this arena many, many times, right? Because we're all human. We all have a sin nature, including myself. And so to any time that I've ever uh, encouraged negative behavior or a modeled negative behavior, negative attitudes, please forgive me. Um, but my hope is that um, even with this message, that people will hear uh, my heart, they'll hear the teaching, and they'll hear the pastoral application behind it. Okay, so here's a man again who's so upset, he's so disturbed by what he's listened to on YouTube or wherever he's read it, most often it's YouTube these days, um, that he's, he's screaming at my neighbors in public, right? This is what I mean by the conspiracy theory mindset. There's this frenetic, agitated, anxious thing that says, I need to save this person, I'm gonna scream. And it creates just the opposite. It pushes people away and it makes the world think Christians are absolutely nuts. Not that we care what the world thinks, um, the world is going to think we're jerks regardless, but let's not give them legitimate reasons to believe that. This is socially unacceptable. Screaming at people at Walmart about Bill Gates, who allegedly worships Satan on purpose and has a plot to vaccinate and microchip everyone in the world, that is socially unacceptable behavior. That is not, the Lord is not leading anyone to do that. Okay, so here's another um, image. I thought this was interesting. This was actually from uh, NBC News. It was about one of the protests taking place down in Texas. Now look, I think there are very legitimate reasons for um, Americans uh, who value the Constitution and different people to be out protesting, saying this is ridiculous. At this point, the lockdown is causing more damage and potentially even much more loss of life um, than the virus itself. Now, I want to be very clear. The virus is real. I fully believe the virus is real and it has real dangers. On the other hand, there's this question that all of our public officials are wrestling with. Um, to what degree do we, do we uh, lock down in order to try to slow the spread of the virus versus taking the Swedish approach, for example, and trying to encourage social distancing while allowing the economy to roll on so as to minimize the damage that shutting the economy down goes, right? So uh, I understand everyone's wrestling through this, but people are at this point getting really frustrated. People are out protesting, and I fully understand and support that. But here's a picture from the protest, and it's a big banner, some folks walking down the street. I don't know if they're in Houston. I think it's Houston. And it says, and this is so funny, it says, Texas will not take the mark of the beast. It's a big banner with the Texas flag. It says, and then it says, vaccine, chip, ID 2020. We'll talk a little bit more about this claim that there is a plan to vaccinate the whole world and insert a microchip into everyone because that's essentially what's believed. Again, this is popping up on 
NBC Nightly News. It's happening at the local Walmart. People are saying, hey, I've got a friend at church. He's an elder who is just going crazy about this stuff. He saw some particular prophecy teacher talking about it. He saw it on YouTube. It's all over Facebook, right? This is affecting the, the, it's affecting the popular mindset of, of the church right now. So we need to address it now. We're going to come back to this. We're going to come back to this whole issue of Bill Gates and the vaccine. We'll talk about it a bit. But what I want to do is look at what the scriptures say. What do the scriptures say? Are we freaking out? Are we going overboard unnecessarily? Um, where is there a need for caution and discernment? And where is there a need to hold steady? Where is there a need to walk in a much more level-headed, logical, scripturally rooted mentality? And this is hopefully, again, where we'll, we'll go with this discussion. So let's begin. We're going to actually begin in uh, Ezekiel chapter 9, because Ezekiel chapter 9 is actually the biblical foundation for the concept of the mark of the beast. Now, it's not the only Old Testament foundation, but it is, it's a very relevant passage, so I'm going to read um, most of the chapter. Ezekiel says, Then I heard him call out in a loud voice, Bring near those who are appointed to execute judgment on the city. So he's talking about these destroying angels. They've been appointed to execute judgment on the city of Jerusalem, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. And I saw six men, these are the angels, coming from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. Just general, just a vague general deadly weapon. Uh, with them was a man clothed in linen who had a writing kit at his side, at his loins. This is interesting. He has a belt with a little, uh, I'm going to assume like a little leather case with writing utensils back in Ezekiel's day. They came in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of God of Israel went up from the cherubim, again, at the Ark of the Covenant where it had been, and it moved to the threshold of the temple. Then the Lord called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing kit. And he said to him, go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those. And I love this, guys. This is, this is powerful because this mark that the men receive, they are prototypes for the end times church. They are a historical prophetic picture of who everyone who's watching this is called to be which are the believers in the last days. And how does it describe them? How does it describe the righteous? It says, put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done in it. So the righteous are those who sigh and groan, who sigh and groan throughout Jerusalem because of all the detestable, abominable things, the sinful things that are taking place throughout the city of Jerusalem. And this is a side note, but this is, this is really uh, one of my personal biggest mandates in my ministry, is to help the church recover the groan, recover the Maranatha cry, recover the groan that in Romans 8, Paul says all of creation feels, that he said the Holy Spirit feels, the cry of Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, he has come, but he's coming back. Come, Lord Jesus, the Spirit and the Bride at the end of the book of Revelation are crying out and saying, Come, Lord Jesus, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And that's a picture of the church in the last days. They will be praying. They will be groaning. They will be sighing. They will be waiting eagerly for the return of Jesus, for the end of the abominations, for the end of this insanity that we are living in right now. Behold, darkness covers the earth deep darkness the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon us. Isaiah 60, right? Before his return, before the dawn, it's always the darkest. Right now, the insanity with everything, with transgenderism and just the multiple 50-some-odd genders that supposedly exist according to the world and the education system and just the mockery and on and on and on, like we could go on forever. Come, Lord Jesus. Jesus himself, according to the author of Hebrews, after he made atonement, he sat down at the right hand of the Father, and from that time forward, he has been waiting, waiting, 
I don't want to say chomping at the bit, but Jesus has been zealously, eagerly waiting to come back and crush his enemies, make his enemies a footstool for his feet, to put an end to the wickedness throughout the earth. And that is the righteous here in Ezekiel 9. They are described as those who grieve, who sigh, who groan, who lament. As I listened, he said to the others, follow him through the city and kill without pity and compassion. Slaughter the old men, the young men, the women, the mothers, and even the children. Don't touch anyone who has the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. So begin with what? How does that apply in our time? Begin with the believers. Judgment begins with the house of God. (sighs) It's terrifying. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there. Ezekiel begins by describing this scene where before the judging angels move through the city and kill without pity everyone, first the Lord marks the righteous, those who groan, with the mark of God on their foreheads. Now, here's what's interesting, is the Hebrew word mark is the letter, the ancient Hebrew letter tav, which if you look at it, is a cross. It's an X. You could say an X, but it's essentially a cross. So even when you go all the way back, again, 500 B.C., Uh, to the time of Ezekiel, before the return from exile, hundreds of years before Jesus. The scriptures have this story about the mark of God, which is contrary to, it's the opposite, obviously, of the mark of the beast. And what is that mark? It's a cross, a cross on the foreheads of the righteous. And that really is, it's a prophetic picture of those that would be marked by the cross of Christ in the last days, by be, be marked with the sign of the Messiah. I understand that there are a few out there, Jehovah's Witnesses and some groups that say Jesus was not crucified on a cross, but that is historically uh, nonsense. So now we're going to turn to the book of Revelation, and we're going to look at the concept of the mark of the beast. And I really believe once we understand what the scriptures actually have to say about the mark of God and the mark of the beast, that it will help calm, to some degree, some of this anxiety, again, that is so prevalent uh, throughout the body of Christ. So let's begin in Revelation chapter 7. This uh, talks about the 144,000. It says, "After After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind, from blowing on the land or the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east. And what did he have? He had the seal of the living God. There it is. Now, for clarity, every believer is presently sealed by the Holy Spirit. It says we have been given the Holy Spirit as a down payment, as a seal, as a guarantee of our future inheritance, of our future resurrection from the dead. But here in the last days, there's something particular And this angel comes, and he he has the seal of the living God. And he called out in a loud voice to the four angels that had been given power to harm the land and the sea. And he said, don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put the seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. And then he goes on, and he seals the 144,000. So first you've got this reference to the seal of God. And he says, and don't harm anyone until we first seal them with the seal of God. So the real first reference in Revelation is to the seal of God, the mark of God. Again, which is reflected back in Ezekiel 9, historically, right? So that is Daniel 7. Now we skip forward to, um, I'm sorry, that's Revelation 7. Now we skip forward to Revelation 9, beginning in verse 3. And again, we're kind of skipping through, but I just want to highlight some of the passages that do talk about this issue of the mark of the beast. So beginning in uh, verse 3, the sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke that comes up out of the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down on the earth, and they were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass or any plant or tree, very similar to uh, chapter 7, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them but only torment them for five months. So the peoples of the earth will be tormented unless they have the mark of God. Okay, so again, it still hasn't got into the issue of the mark of the beast, but it reiterates that Satan will have authority to torment 
those that don't have the mark of God. Now we skip forward to Revelation chapter 13, and we're going to begin at verse 13. It's talking about the false prophet. Okay, you've got the beast, the antichrist, and then you've got the false prophet, his assistant. And this false prophet, it says, it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs, it was given power to perform on behalf of the beast. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image. Okay, so this is the image of the beast. It it set up an image in honor of the beast, who was wounded by the sword, yet lived. Now, let me just say something here. Let me stop. There's often this question um, among interpreters, prophecy, students of scripture, and they say, is the beast here the kingdom or is it the king? Is it the Antichrist or his empire? And this is the nature of a lot of these prophetic passages, is there's this telescoping dimension where at times it seems to zero in more on the individual, but other times it seems to zero in more so on the empire. And so really the foundation for this motif, this symbol of Uh, an empire, which is a beast. It begins back in Daniel chapter 7, where the beasts are kingdoms. Okay, so here in the book of Revelation, beast initially is used of a kingdom, but then it sort of seems to zero in on the individual. And we need not get overly caught up on this. We need not get overly caught up on the debate between which one is it, because from a scriptural perspective, it's both. King, kingdom. They're largely inseparable. You know, you can't have one without the other. So the question here is, is this the Antichrist or is it the empire? Because that would actually largely determine the nature of the image of the beast. If the false prophet sets up an image in honor of a, uh, an image, by the way, the word there in the Greek, it's essentially the word that would most often be used for idols. But it doesn't always have to be an anthropomorphic human-shaped statue. This is important. Idols can take many forms, and particularly if this is an idol in honor of the empire. Now, please hear me. Um, If the false prophet sets something up in the temple that all people are obligated to submit to, could it be something as simple as a flag, an insignia, or does it have to be? You know, because we have all of these fantastic... um, Uh, ideas that float around in the body of Christ. It's going to be a hologram, you know, this type of thing. Maybe it will be. Maybe it will be some type of crazy, because it goes on and it talks about how the the image will be given the ability to speak, right? We can talk about this some more. Um, And so everyone assumes that it's this animated anthropomorphic idol. But there's actually some other uh, explanations, some possibilities. I'll be honest with you, because I believe uh, that this will have an Islamic um, character to it, um, I look at issues. I, you know, it says that the image of the beast, this, um, this thing that will be set up on the Temple Mount, it will be given a voice. That's what it says. It will be given the, the ability to speak. And it will cause everyone who does not bow down to be killed. Okay, so let's just think about this. Think about throughout the Islamic world today. Um, I just listened to a recording just now that was out of Minneapolis um, where the prayer, the call to prayer during Ramadan is going off every day, blasting out over the city in certain parts of Minneapolis. This has been happening in Detroit for a long time. In the United States, the Muslim call to prayer goes out. Throughout the Islamic world, throughout the Middle East, this is normal. You know, I have friends every day that they hear the call to prayer right outside their window constantly. It's, It's very foreign to most Americans. But this permeates the Middle East. Now, if a caliphate, okay, if a khalifa, um, the government of Islam is set up and Sharia law is set in place, then what do you have? Where does the call to prayer come from? It comes from the minarets. The minarets, which are raised up all over the city prominently um, in any, you know, they are always given the place of the most prominence in any Muslim majority city. And what do they say? Come to prayer, come bow down bow down to uh, Allah, to the God of Islam, Muhammad is the final messenger of Islam, and you know, everything that goes with it. And um, it's, the beast is given a voice. When you think about it, back in John's day, 
if he were to have seen the megaphones that are placed on the minarets all over the Middle East, come to prayer, come bow down, and to imagine what that would be like if it was an enforced system where everyone who is not a Muslim is either mandated to either convert to Islam or die if, in such a future scenario. Okay, I'm just throwing that out there. Um, it could be something crazy like a hologram. It could be, uh, it could be a genuine idol of some kind. Um, or it could be something like a flag that represents an empire, that represents this newly established empire, and everyone is obligated to submit to this system, this caliphate. It could be something very simple like that. Okay, but that's the image of the beast. It's the image in honor of the beast that will be set up, by the way, in the temple, on the Temple Mount, um, at the time of the abomination of desolation, which takes place when? three and a half years from the return of Jesus, three and a half years into the final seven years. Okay, so at the very least, that's a minimum of three and a half years away because we can all agree that we have not entered the final seven years yet. So that's an important factor in terms of all the, the panic and the fear. Is the mark of the beast here? No, because the mark of the beast will not be set up until everyone is obligated to take it. Now again, people could say, but is this a predecessor? Is this something leading up to it? Okay, that's another discussion. So the second beast was given power. Here it is, to breathe to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak. And it caused all who refused to worship the, uh, the image to be killed. It also forced all people, small, great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark, either on their right hands or their foreheads. So this is the anti-mark of God. The mark of the beast is the satanic alternative to the mark of God. So one is the mark of Christ, the mark of the cross, the mark of God, the, the Hebrew Tav, right? They've been marked and set aside not to be killed, not to be destroyed. And then everyone else um, that submits to this system will be forced to take a mark alternately, either on their right hands or foreheads, so that they couldn't buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is, now, here, now please listen to this, the mark, which is the name of the beast, or the number of its name. This is so important. The mark of the beast is the number of the beast is the name of the beast. This is so critical. You have here in Revelation 13, you have four things. You have the number of the beast, the name of the beast, the mark of the beast, and the image of the beast. The name, the number, and the mark are all integrally related. They are essentially the same thing. The image of the beast is integrally related, but yet it's a little bit different. Or it's potentially a little bit different. But it represents the same thing. It represents the same thing. Okay. Now, later in Revelation 19, well, actually, let me begin, begin in Revelation 14. Uh, beginning in verse 9. It says, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives the mark. So notice that the mark of the beast, whoever receives the mark on, its, on their forehead or right hand, they are also those who worship the beast. Now, is, does this mean worship the beast as though he's God? Or does it, because the word there in Greek is proskuneo. Okay, does it mean worship as God? Because that's most often how the word is used, but not always. It can also mean submit. It can also mean bow down to, as to a king. Okay, so everyone is obligated at the very least to fully submit to the beast. Let's just say that. Because I personally don't believe they're actually going to worship him as God. That's a whole nother discussion. But I believe that they will be obligated to essentially worship him. To essentially bow down, submit to like a dog before its master, like a slave before its, his master, like a servant before his king. Okay, that's the, that's the meaning of the term proskuneo, to prostrate before. And it's interesting that it specifically means to bow down, because that is exactly what Muslims are expected to do as part of their prayer, to bow down at the, at the time that the minarets, the voice is given, that the call goes out. And again, we're, we're looking at present-day realities and projecting them speculatively into the future, speculatively in the, in the future. Now, one of the convictions that I have, and I'll just throw this out, one of the convictions that I have is that the things that the book of Revelation describes will be far more just like today than we imagine. 
there's this kind of um, fantastic, um, wild, fantastical, wild, out there, science fiction type of fantasy world that has often been mixed into people's minds within our prophetic imaginations concerning the book of Revelation. First of all, because it uses all kinds of crazy imagery and symbolism, but also because of popular Christian TVs and movies and novels. And so we, we have this idea that we're going to cross this certain line after the rapture or whatever it might be, however people view that, and suddenly the whole world is going to become like today, and all of a sudden it's going to become this future science fiction fantasy world where everything is just going to be crazy. And I would argue, guys, that the truth is things are going to be very much like they are today in many, many ways. How does Jesus describe the last days in his return? He goes, it's going to be just like in the days of Noah. People will be going about their ordinary lives, marrying and giving in marriage. And then he comes like a thief. So there's going to be all kinds of horrible things unfolding throughout the earth. I want to be clear. But by the same token, many people will actually be going about their ordinary lives. <coughs> and so this is, this is contrary to the populist, the popular idea concerning the end times. And so because my conviction is it's something that could unfold right in front of us. Because people are often, they're far more willing to believe something that's crazy, that's wild, than to actually believe that something the scriptures speak of is right in front of them. And because it's my conviction that the end times will be far more reasonable, far more normal, far more earthy um, than we often imagine, um, then I'm willing to look at many things in the earth today and say, could this be? Rather than, you know, this enforcement camps where everyone is forced to, um, you know, be injected with this microchip and, you know, how the movies portray it. Could it just be something as simple as an Islamic empire is set up, the government is set up, that those who are not Muslims under that system will be forced to convert or be executed, um, where there'll be tremendous socioeconomic pressure on Christians and Jews and anybody else that's not a Muslim, minority religions, Yazidis, etc. That's easy to believe because we've already seen it. We've seen it under ISIS. We've seen it multiple times down through history. And it doesn't have all of the craziness and the technology, and those things, again, could be part of it. But I think that we need to be willing to consider the fact that maybe the things the book of Revelation describes are actually... We've already seen them, or at least shadows of them. We haven't seen the fullness. Why? Because the reality of what this 666 is has not yet been revealed. And let me just say as a side note, having co-authored the book, uh, God's War on Terror, with Walid Shubat uh, years ago, um, and Walid would agree, for what it's worth, this idea that still to this day floats around out there on the internet, that the Mark of the Beast is actually an Arabic, um, it was in the book of Revelation intended to be Arabic, and John saw Arabic and accidentally wrote Greek, that doesn't work. It simply is not true. Walid would acknowledge that that is not the case. And the reason, quite simply, is because the Greek cursive that does admittedly partially resemble Arabic, it was not used in any of the early manuscripts for a few hundred years after it was initially written. The earliest manuscripts of the book of Revelation that mentions 666, they don't use shorthand cursive Greek. They use Koine Greek, which is more like if you were to write 666, capital S, capital I, capital X, 6-H-U-N-D-R-E-D. There's no way you could confuse that for Arabic. And that is how it was revealed to John. The earliest manuscripts that we have are in Koine Greek, not this cursive Greek that came later, that admittedly does uh, somewhat partially resemble Arabic. Okay, so the theory just doesn't work. I want to be clear. If anybody still holding on to that, um, that has been debunked a long time ago. And I've been saying that for years myself, even though I did participate in writing that book and, um, and helping Walid articulate his um, opinion at the time. But uh, I believe since then he's even um, changed his mind. Okay, but with that said, we don't know what the 666 is yet. We have no idea because the Antichrist has not been revealed. The mark of the beast is not here yet. But now let me, we've touched on Revelation 14, right? Now let's go to Revelation 19. This is important. Revelation 19, verse 19 through 21. Then I saw the beast, the kings of the earth. These are all of the 
followers of the Antichrist and their armies. They're gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. Now, by the way, from a pre-wrath perspective, or let's say we're talking about the rapture, pre-trib, post-trib, pre-wrath. I'm going to throw something out here. If Jesus has not returned from heaven yet, if the pre-trib or post-trib perspective that Jesus suddenly bursts forth from heaven, and that's what it's describing here in Revelation 19, is true, how do they know? How, do the, how does the beast and the kings of the earth and the armies know? I would argue that the return of Jesus is a complex, and this is the perspective of the pre-wrath perspective. It's the, it's the opinion, uh, it's the interpretation of the scriptures that the return of Jesus is a complex series of events. And that the picture of Jesus returning from heaven with his armies in Revelation 19, already soaked in blood, by the way, which is the blood of his enemies, Isaiah 63, I would argue that that is not the parousia. That is not his initial coming. It's actually, it, that's actually telling the story of Armageddon. When he comes from heaven again, or at least from the sky, let's put it this way, with his armies, and he slays the beast. But they gather together to fight against him. That indicates that they are already aware of the rider. It's not because he comes as a thief to those who don't know him. It comes as a surprise to those who don't know him. Yet here it says that the beast and the kings of the earth, they gather together, let's fight him. I would argue the return of Jesus unfolds, and I'll discuss this in great detail in my forthcoming book, Sinai to Zion. And I would also encourage you to read some of Alan Kirshner's stuff. He does a fantastic job of showing the scriptural case for a complex return of Jesus that unfolds. Guys, when Jesus came the first time, he was born of a virgin into a stable. He was, you know, she changed his diapers, so to speak. He was nursed at Mary's breast. He was raised as a child. He went through all of the earthy process. And when he returns, he doesn't come back with a magic wand. Ta-da! Everything's made new. He comes back with a sword. And there is going to, again, be a very real earthy in real time carrying out of the vengeance of God against his enemies and the restoration of the earth. It doesn't just happen with the blink of an eye instantly. He comes back with a sword. Okay, so that's just sort of a side note, but it's interesting. They gather together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast, alternatively, was taken prisoner along with the false prophet who had performed the signs in its presence. So there's the false prophet. He deceived those who, who did, he, who did he deceive? Those who accepted the mark of the beast and those who worshiped its image with these signs. Both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. The rest were killed with a sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse and all the birds ate their fill of the flesh. Okay, so here's the point is Whoever takes the mark of the beast, the scriptures repeatedly say, whoever takes the mark of the beast also submits to and worships the beast. And whoever takes the mark of the beast goes to hell forever. They go to the lake of fire. This is the point, guys. Christians primarily, I want to go back to the Bill Gates stuff. I want to go back to the microchip stuff. Christians today popularly primarily discuss the mark of the beast as microchip technology. That's the primary way they think about it. And they go, I'm not going to take a microchip. It's the mark of the beast. I've been, I've been seeing this in movies. I've been hearing it in sermons for years. The Bible, on the other hand, says that whoever takes the mark of the beast goes to hell. Now, please hear me. People go to hell based on their acceptance or their rejection of Jesus the Messiah. Their acceptance or rejection of God, of Yahweh, and his Messiah, the Father and the Son. That is the issue that determines whether or not someone enters into paradise and receives the inheritance provided through the blood, shed blood of the Messiah on the cross, or is cast into the lake of fire. That is the issue. Satan has not figured out a loophole in the system. The mark of the beast is not something you can take accidentally. Oh, whoops, I took the mark of the beast. Oh, no, now I'm going to hell, even though I've lived as a lifelong Christian. I should have paid more attention to YouTube. No. The mark of the beast will be a doctrinal issue. It will be a creedal matter. There will inherently with the mark of the beast be, hear me, a rejection of Jesus. 
a rejection of Jesus, a rejection of God the Father. And they will identify with and support and submit to the beast. Now, what does the Bible say about the beast? It says that he will, in, it says it in Daniel chapter 8, in Daniel chapter 11, it says it here in Revelation multiple times. He will say unheard of things. He will speak monstrous things against God the Father, against the commander of the host, against Jesus. He will speak against God and against his Messiah. Why do the kings of the earth rage? Why, do they, why are they in such a tumult? Psalm 2, they gather together against the Lord Yahweh and his Moshiach, right? Against his Messiah, against the Father, against the Son, against the Father and against Jesus, against Yeshua. Okay, however, whichever term you want to use, the mark of the beast will be an identification with the, the beast, the Antichrist, who is the quintessential blasphemer. Okay, as we said, the mark of the beast. We don't know what the mark of the beast is yet. We don't know what 666 means yet. It will be revealed. The name, the number, and the mark of the beast are all essentially the same thing. It says the name of the beast is the number of his name and the mark. The mark is the name, the number. They are all intricately connected. Okay? And it says this. It says that the beast is covered with the names of blasphemy. His name is the name of blasphemy. Okay, so again, please understand, the mark of the beast will inherently, inherently mean that whoever takes it will renounce Yeshua, will renounce Jesus. It's not, guys, the mark of the beast is not like a nerf tag game. Like, up, you know, like they held you down and they inserted the microchip and now you're going to hell. Whoops. That is not what the mark of the beast will be. You will have to willingly accept it. It will be brazenly evil. The Lord is not sitting in heaven going, yeah, everyone served me faithfully, but if they don't resist with their sawed-off, double-barrel, 12-gauge shotguns, I'm picking on Texans. I ain't going to take no mark of the beast. You know, it's not an issue of you need to resist. Otherwise, you're going to go to hell. I need to protect my family. Otherwise, they're going to get embedded and go to hell. No. The mark of the beast will inherently be a creedal. It will be an identification with a system, a religious system. It has to be a religious system. John 16, verse 2, the time is coming when everyone who kills you will believe that they are offering God a service. They're not atheists. They're not humanists. Now, well, there's plenty of persecution from them. I want to be clear. But the time is coming when those who kill us will believe they're offering their God a service. They do these things. Why? Because Jesus said they don't know the Father. They don't know me, the Father and the Son. Okay, so this is who the Antichrist denies. He denies Elohim Ab, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He rejects that God. He rejects the Hemdat Isha, the desire of women. He he rejects the Messiah. He rejects the Father and the Son. 1 John 2, 22 says this is the doctrine. This is the spirit of Antichrist. He denies the Father. He denies the Son. This twofold denial is consistent throughout the scriptures concerning the theology of the Antichrist. Okay? Now, I, when I, you go, well, Joel, okay, you're saying that Bill Gates and the Micra and all this vaccine is not the mark of the beast. Yes, that's what I'm saying. It's not the mark of the beast. Well, then what is it? We don't know yet. We don't know yet. But again, I believe there are things on the earth that already give us an indicator of what it may look like, something along the lines of what it may look like. Now, what is the very creed of Islam? Again, we know the doctrines of the Antichrist is that God, uh, is that the Antichrist will reject God. He will reject the Father, and he will reject the Son. Everyone who rejects the Son does not have the Father, right? So it's twofold denial. What is the very creed of Islam? Lot, there's no God other than Allah. Lot, Ilah, Allah, right? And then they say, and there's no other, the, Muhammad is the final messenger. Muhammadan, Rasul, he is the final messenger, they say, of Allah. It is the creed that every Muslim says when they convert to Islam. It's the words that every Muslim father whispers into the ear of his child when they're first born. It's the words that are whispered into the ear of everyone just before they die, every Muslim just before they die. 
That is the Shahada. It's the creed of conversion. Uh, it's the banner over Islam. When you see many of the, um, the headbands were worn by these jihadis, it's the Shahada. When you see the words written on the flag of ISIS, it's the Shahada. There's no God other than Allah. And Muhammad is the final. It's a denial of the Father. It's a denial of Yahweh. It's a denial of the Son who is, you know, the Lord has spoken to us by the prophets in the past, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. He is the ultimate and final revelation of God. Not Muhammad. Not Muhammad. Okay, now yes, this is not an issue of, but are there New Testament prophets? Personally, I believe yes, but that's different. That's very different than God coming and speaking to us through Old Testament prophets or through his Son. Okay, the creed of Islam denies the Father and it denies the Son. It is really probably the best embodiment of antichrist uh, theology in the earth today. Now, what does the mark of the beast look like? What might it look like speculatively? I remember during the Arab Spring uh, talking to my friends in Egypt and they told the story of a Coptic Egyptian Christian man and he lived in a Muslim majority neighborhood uh, and he had a shop. And the shop was his livelihood. And once the Muslim Brotherhood, Ikhwan, once they took over under Mohammed Morsi for the one year there, um, uh, which ended, I guess, like June 2013, okay, so from like the middle of 2012 to 2013 after the Arab Spring, it was controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood. During that time, the, 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 the more radical Muslims became much more radical, and they were actually uh, acting as though a, a, a caliphate had been established. And Morsi used that language, by the way. Millions of martyrs marching to Jerusalem, you know, this type of rhetoric. But this Coptic Christian man with a shop, the Muslims in his neighborhood, that he had, they had known for years, they stopped patronizing his shop. They started buying anything from him. And they said, we won't buy anything from you unless you convert to Islam. And he resisted for a time until the, the bolts were tightened so much so that he finally couldn't feed his family. And with tears in his eyes, he converted to Islam and he said the Shahada in order to feed his family. Under pressure, he essentially renounced Christ. Now, you could say, well, he didn't believe so in his heart. And folks like John MacArthur would say, well, even after you take the mark of the beast, you can still repent, you know, because he's a firm believer in once saved, always saved. And, you know, we get all kind, into all kinds of different theological discussions and debates here. But this is a picture of what I personally imagine the mark of the beast may look like. Uh, a religious economic system set up whereby you are, in order to buy and sell, you have to be part of the religious system and you have to renounce Christ. You have to submit to the beast. It could be something very, very simple. Okay, so enough uh, discussing um, Islam and the mark of the beast. What does the Bible say? Now let's talk about Bill Gates. Is there a reality that he's trying to force everyone to take a microchip? First of all, let me just say this, guys. I want to be honest with you. All these Christians panicking about the microchip. Are there people who are doing implantable chips? Yes. Is that technology developed? Yes. But guys, let's just be honest. That is so 1990s. Like, we are so past microchips. Microchip is outdated uh, technology. There are retinal scans. They can scan all kinds of things. Like 20 feet away, they can scan your retina and have all of your information in the system. They don't need to implant anything. They don't need to. Like we're way past that, okay? But we're still kind of in this 1980s, 1990s panic. Microchip, we've been told it's a microchip. So therefore microchip is the bad thing. Listen guys, Christians because of the mark of the beast and understandably so, we have been freaked out every time some new technology comes along. When Social Security came along, Christians were panicking. This is the mark of the beast. I won't take a Social Security number. I refuse, right? Everyone now has a Social Security number. When credit cards came along, I will not take a credit card. Then when they added the little microchip onto the credit card, that was. there's been waves of Christians panicking, fearfully panicking, sounding the alarm at every new step forward in technology. Now, let me say this. There are tremendous reasons, valid reasons for us to be concerned with the development of technology as it relates to the overstepping of government control, of the police state, 
of a lack of privacy, of government monitoring and tracking, and all these things are valid, very valid. And much of this stuff may eventually play into the issue with the mark of the beast. However, guys, the issue that we need to be concerned with is not the technology. The issue is the doctrine. The issue is the creed. That's the real issue that sends people to hell. God doesn't care about technology. God doesn't even, I'll be honest with you, God doesn't care if someone got a microchip in their skin. That in and of itself is not pure evil. I think it's dumb. I don't want a microchip in me. I wouldn't do that, okay? But we all, let's just be honest. I mean, guys, we all, where is it? We all carry around a tracking device and it is glued to our hip. Not everyone, but virtually everyone. I don't know what the numbers are. 95% of everyone watching this that is sounding the alarm about a microchip carries one around in their pocket. And it is, they, we have all become cyborgs. We have all become cyborgs. I'm not picking on my wife, but she can't drive up to the store without her maps on. <laughs> she, I'm just kidding. But she, she navigates everywhere. I go, we've been there like 10 times. Yeah, but I never pay attention. We've become cyborgs. We have allowed these things to be a part of us. And so many, my kids, same thing. They don't know directions. I go, go west. They go, I don't know west. We live in a state that's gridded out. Like every street goes, it's so easy. Anyway, I'm being a typical dad. Um, probably a bad husband. I'm just kidding. But the point is we are all cyborgs. We are all cyborgs. We all have accepted technology. But there's just this lingering idea. Okay, so now is Bill Gates trying to force a vaccine? Guys, when you go on the actual videos, and because this is what I do, I'm a researcher, right? When I write books, I, I go back to the original source documents. And I find them and I make sure that something someone is citing is true. So I went online and um, you know I watched a couple of videos, people are sending me stuff. I won't name any names. I don't want to call anyone out and pick on anyone again. We already pointed out Rick Wiles, uh, but he's so far off the deep end um, at this point, it doesn't matter. He's at this point a wolf in, in sheep's clothing for all intents and purposes. But there's other, I think, probably well-intentioned prophecy teachers sounding the alarm, and they say Bill Gates wants to um, force us all to take a vaccine. That's not true. That's not true. Bill Gates, and they go, yeah, but Bill Gates wants to, he, he's, a, he's a, a eugenicist. He wants to wipe out billions of people. No. But I saw him talk about population reduction. Bill Gates is a typical technocrat, elitist liberal, okay? He is a typical liberal elitist, do-gooder, who believes that family planning, who believes that vaccines are the way to reduce unnecessary deaths among third world developing nations, among the most impoverished throughout Africa and this type of thing. And when poor families have proper family plan, like that, there's the whole liberal narrative that when they are vaccinated and when they don't have a high number of, of infant deaths, which is what happens in third world countries where you don't have a lot of vaccinations, you have a much higher number of infant deaths now, they might have a much smaller number of, um, of uh, autism and things like that. Okay, so listen, I'm, I'm not trying to enter into the vaccine debate. Um, it's a risk, it's a cost risk benefit analysis. Everyone has to make the decision and there are plenty of people out there who go, I choose not to get vaccines. I'm not trying to enter into that debate. I'm just saying Bill Gates believes that, vac and vaccines do save lives, right? Like polio is not a yearly thing. Um, and so on and so forth. However, yeah, okay, I want to acknowledge vaccines have changed. There's a lot of dangers. There's a lot of potential side effects. There's a lot of uh, shenanigans due to the billions of dollars that a lot of these corporations make. Okay, I want to be clear. I understand that. Um, however, um, Bill Gates does not want to vaccinate people because he wants to kill billions of people. He wants to reduce the population through family planning. When you actually listen to the full context of what he says, he doesn't say, I want to kill millions of people. He's not worshiping Satan on purpose openly by sending secret signs. This is what I mean by the conspiracy theory mentality. And the reason that I'm sensitive to it is because, guys, I post videos on YouTube. I dedicate my life to teaching, to ministry, to trying to be just a humble servant, a good dad, a good father, and uh, an honest teacher, right? I, I strive just to live simply and do that. 
to give myself to the Middle East and, and all of these things. And yet every time I release a video, I will be accused multiple times of worshiping Satan, of being involved in some secret society. People will point out, they'll go like, what's that emblem on your wall? Why eight stars? That's a satanic sign. Uh, what about these idols behind you? You obviously are sending secret signals. No, the statuettes came from Iran. They were given to me as gifts from my friends in the underground Christian church in Iran. Um, one of them is Darius. The other one is a, um, a Persian soldier, right? It's just, they're historical from the Persepolis uh, museum. They, they have the Persepolis um, temple there. It's a, you know, it's like going to Jerusalem and coming back with knickknacks. I don't bow before them. I'm not an idolater. I'm not worshiping ancient Assyrian gods. These are statues from the Persepolis. Uh, and it reminds me uh, of my friends. And my heart is with my uh, friends in Iran throughout the Middle East. What about this eight-pointed star, Joel? The eight-pointed star is the most well-recognized architectural image throughout the Middle East. So many ministries use it. I put in the middle of it a crown of thorns. Rather than the obvious cross, I put the crown of thorns um, to symbolize my ministry, my primary call, which is to bring the gospel to the Middle East, to the Muslim world. Okay, It means what I say it means because I made it. It's not a secret sign indicating that I secretly worship the devil. The reason I'm sensitive, because listen, with every conspiracy theory, and we have to think about this as Christians, we are accusing another person made in the image of God. Granted, humans are capable of immense evil. I want to recognize that. But we are accusing someone, and not just one person. Oftentimes, the flat earth conspiracy theory, so to speak, whoever believes in the flat earth conspiracy theory by virtue has to accuse thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Christian scientists of being part of the conspiracy of deception. With every conspiracy theory, you have to think how many people would have to be in on this in order for it to be a valid theory. And therefore, how many people am I accusing of purposefully, willingly hiding the truth? Okay, so, you know, is Bill Gates purposefully trying to introduce? Bill Gates would love, yes, to see a vaccine. He believes it would be good. Everyone who is, you know, a, a secular liberal wants to see, who's not part of the anti-vax movement, they want to see vaccines because they want to stop the coronavirus pandemic, right? You can't blame them for that. Okay, but what about Joel? I read an article that talks about nanotechnology, nanodots. What's that all about? Bill Gates did sponsor, again, he's got his hands in a million things. He did sponsor a program, it was a study done at MIT, where they were theoretically exploring technology that when people got vaccines, it would deposit what was called a micro needle. Um, that would deposit these what are called nanodots. Well, that sounds like the mark of the beast. Essentially, it would be a dissolvable... What does nano mean? Nano means it's much smaller than micro. Nano is at the molecular level. So essentially, some, let's say, like uh, dots that are so small that you couldn't even see them with the human eye. They would be the size of a molecule that something theoretically like a device could detect that says this person's been vaccinated. The purpose is for third world countries where they can know that various people have been vaccinated. That's the idea. Now, is that scary as it, as it pertains to government overreach, control, lack of privacy? Yes, absolutely. Does it exist? Does the technology exist? No. It doesn't even exist. There is no plan in place. There is no plan on the table. And now here's the thing. As I went on, people send me videos. Bill Gates wants to microchip. I went to the, the, the article, and, and these people are saying, he wants to put a microchip. But then the, what they cite, the article they cite, is talking about nanodots. And I go, wait, nanodots are essentially, again, a smaller than microscopic, way smaller than microscopic. At the molecular level, a type of tattoo. Again, just dots that indicate, and that's not like the whole person's life story. That just says, yes, no, they've been vaccinated. And that's what they're talking about. Now, again, is there a problem with that? Yes. I don't want, and I don't want the government putting any type of mark into me at all. Is there a plan on the table? No. Are Christian prophecy teachers reading articles about nanodots and then adding microchip? Yes. Is that dishonest? Yes. Is it on purpose? I'm not saying it is. 
I'm just saying in the prophecy world, there's a culture of exaggerating and saying, but there must be a connection. There's a lot of reasons to be concerned. And I go, okay, but let's at least be honest. Let's at least be honest. Is there any plan in place to forcibly force everyone to accept a microchip? No. What about ID 2020, Joel? What about ID 2020? Again, a theoretical plan. There's no plan in place. There's no um, law. And, and guys, I'm telling you, no one would put up with this. It's, it's, it's being discussed. And it talks about, and this is something, ID2020 is something that Bill Gates was involved with. And he talks about what is called a digital certificate. And again, I saw multiple articles where Christians would say, digital certificate, parentheses, i.e., microchip. <laughs> And I go, that's not true. A digital certificate can be anything. Guys, again, it can be something as simple as a retinal scan. It could be something as simple as blockchain technology in the cloud. In fact, when you actually read what ID2020 is, it's not a microchip. It's something in the cloud. And it actually talks about blockchain technology, which means this. We would have full control over it, not the government. That's a good thing, actually, for what it's worth. I mean, you know, if we were to have something out there in the cloud which has all of our information that is password protected, only accessible by us, that takes technology control away from the government and puts it in our hands. Yeah, but they'll eventually get it. I understand that. Again, there are legitimate reasons to discuss all of these things as it concerns and relates to government control. But stop freaking out, stop lying, stop making connections that don't exist, stop panicking and let, because listen guys, the more that the global population grows, the more that some of this crazy technology expands, the more that sensors expand all over the world of every kind that you can imagine, from cameras to everything, to, the, to you know, it used to just be a song in the 80s, right? You know, the, the eye in the sky. Um, now it's real. They're monitoring everything. We are being tracked. We are being followed. And there's room for paranoia. You know, the schizophrenics have a point. They're, we're being watched. The more that technology develops and the closer that we get to the return of Jesus, assuming that technology will develop, which it will, the more that there will be legitimate reasons for us to be concerned, to be worried, to be resistant. Okay? I want to acknowledge that. However, if there is ever a time that we need to hold steady, that we need to be level-headed, not people of panic, not flipping out, not screaming at people at Walmart about Bill Gates worshiping the devil, this kind of stuff, we, it, it's, it's now. And we as believers, we need to be level-headed. We need to be cautious. We need to hold steady. And yet we seem to be the community of the boy that cried wolf. Every time there's a new sign in the stars, every time there's something happens, we just have leaders and voices that jump out there and go, this is that, this is that, run for the hills. And then people jump on board and it becomes popular and everyone freaks out. And that's understandable. Again, I'm not picking on anyone. There's a lot of reason for anxiety and concern right now, especially with stuff like the virus. There's always going to be shenanigans. I don't trust government. I want to be clear, and we shouldn't be. But there's a difference between being cautious, being, between being skeptical, between being Bereans and being anxious and fearful and paranoid and flipping out. Because when you warn against flipping out and being paranoid, people go, yeah, but there are legitimate reasons to be concerned. And I go, no, I understand that. But let's do so in a spirit of sobriety, with temperance, we are not people of fear. The Lord has not given us a spirit of fear. And things are about to get worse, right? The closer that we get to the return of Jesus, things are about to get worse. We need to be people of sobriety and of temperance. We need to hold steady. So I hope that this word uh, is received. I hope that you understand what I'm saying. I know that it will still upset people because I say that Bill Gates probably, I don't know, I don't know Bill Gates' motives, but every, everyone who really worships Satan that I've ever met was usually just a maladjusted social high school loser who just wants attention. Um, people like Bill Gates are usually liberal do-gooders who think they're the saviors of the world, 
who want to use their billions to, you know, make themselves look better and this type of thing, usually not overtly worshiping Satan on purpose. Could I be wrong? Of course. I don't know Bill Gates. I don't know his hearts. I don't know his motivations. But before we accuse people of of worshiping Satan on purpose, again, I get accused of it constantly. Um, As Christians, we need to be careful of who we accuse. We need to be slow to accuse. Satan is the accuser, ultimately, right? We are people who... um, (laughs) We're to be sober, sober and level-headed. So amen and amen. I hope this was helpful. God bless you all. Look forward to seeing you next time. We'll jump back into the Maranatha Global Bible Study. Until then, God bless. Maranatha.